what's up guys this is Bama Jaybird and I'm Josh it's good to see everyone again I've got what I hope will be an interesting topic for you today recently I uh, posted a video where we had gone thrifting in Montgomery and we found a Levi's trucker jacket that appears to be uh, a big E vintage uh, jacket and so one of the things that we've run into is knowing that there are a lot of fakes out there and knowing that uh, there's also uh, LVCs or Levi's vintage clothing reproductions that very much mimic these old jackets. We wanted to be certain before uh, listing this on eBay that we had an authentic Levi's vintage jacket. Since we wanted to make sure that this jacket was indeed authentic, I have taken uh, quite a bit of time to do some researching and I just thought I would share some of that with you in hopes that it might help you out. I'll also add some links at the bottom of this video that you can go check out. I'll be honest with you, the information regarding Levi's and specifically how to date them can sometimes be a little bit confusing and, and vague. It seems like there is not a definitive resource out there and it just requires a lot of digging. And even then it seems as though the lines can be somewhat blurred between the, the various defining characteristics of, of the dates of when one thing was produced versus another and how those dates will then overlap. So that being said, I've got quite a few notes uh, that I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to not just read to you, but just to share with you. Uh, first of all, a little bit about the background behind Levi's. If you're not familiar with this, uh, one of the things you should know about Levi's is it's a truly American uh, brand. It, it was one of the uh, major American trademarks and brands that, that really is identifiable with our country in terms of clothing. And though it may not be a designer uh, brand in a sense, right? Uh, vintage Levi's have very much became uh, a very desirable uh, product in terms of being thought of almost as designer. And so the price has gone up uh, exponentially uh, in recent years. And the older the, the item is, uh, the more expensive it can get, even into the thousands of dollars for things that date into the, uh, I would say, the 40s, 50s, and before, if you can run into those items. And even some items that are not quite that old. So the history of Levi's dates back to a man named Levi Strauss. And of course, he had a partner named Jacob Davis that we... Uh, could also mention, but this was established the company in 1853 uh, in, in San Francisco. And so he had moved there uh, in response to the gold rush. And once he got there, uh, moving from California, or to, sorry, to California, moving to California from the East Coast, um, he is going to be immersed, of course, in the culture of the area, which was, you know, kind of a rough and rowdy place at the time during the time of this gold rush. And one of the things that he noticed was that the clothing seemed to not be durable enough for those that were engaged in the mining process and just this really roughneck style life that they were living. And so in 1873, he is going to introduce the first, what we consider the very first Levi's, the 501s. Uh, these are those traditional Levi's uh, that have the button fly and um, th this again is in response to that need for more durable clothing and, and the way that he addresses this is by making a denim that is fastened using copper rivets and that indeed is going to be patented in may of 1873. now these first this first uh iteration if you will of the 501 is actually referred to or named uh very long it's not a short name but they're just called the blue denim copper riveted waist overalls so Guys, as always, uh, if you haven't uh, subscribed already, please take time to do so. It doesn't cost you anything. It sure helped me a lot. Um, make sure to hit that like button, hit that notification button. Really appreciate all that you guys do for me. I really appreciate all of you that have been watching, all of you that have subscribed. Uh, please, uh, any, any input you have to make things better, something I can do, a topic you'd like to hear something about, uh, drop us a comment. Let us know what's going on, what you think, and uh, I'll do my best to address those topics. Now. Of course, most men have worn overalls up to this point. Well, these are going to be, you know, only to the waist, which makes sense why we call them waist overalls. But they are, of course, the forerunners or the original 501s uh, that were produced. And so um, that being said, the first blue jeans, as, as we think of them, didn't have 
a pocket tab. They did not have what we think of that, that classic red tab. That being said, as far as I know, as far as research, I can tell the oldest pair of Levi's that are in the actual Levi's archive that they possess is from 1879. They simply refer to those as the double X Levi's. Now in 1901, uh, they start to make some changes. This is when the fifth pocket is added. And so we think of, you know, Levi's or of blue jeans as having, you know, the two rear pockets, the two front pockets, but also that small pocket on the right hand side that sets above the larger pocket on the front. And so that fifth pocket was added, the change or watch pocket. And that was a pretty significant change. Um, also, uh, um, in 1936, we have the red tab uh, added to uh, Levi's, and this is put on the back right pocket. Now, the reason for adding the red tab was because they had uh, endured a lot of copycats, if you will. And so uh, people trying to copy what Levi Strauss had done with Levi's in order to stop them from being able to profit off of his ideas and to keep, you know, to keep Levi's to be very much trademarked and, and to set them apart and people to know them when they see them, that red tab was used. What a great marketing idea. And in fact, it becomes synonymous, this red tab with Levi's. And along with that, we have what we think of as the big E because it was on this tab that we first have Levi stitched in and spelled out in all capital letters. Thusly, we call it the Big E because when the change was made uh, to, to move away from this uh, beginning in 1971, we're going to find that the Levi's tabs being produced then uh, had a capital L only and the rest of it was lowercase, thus the little E, Levi's tab. Okay, all that being said, um, this was... Again, the, the big E tabs were produced up till 1971, but hold that thought because as often there is, I feel like here's a twist. Now, look, I'm not an expert. I, in fact, I'll be honest with you, you do your own research and you're going to find that almost everything is very hard to prove. There are some certain facts, yes, uh, but there's so many blurry lines in these, these uh, definitive characteristics. And so... Again, the red tab was for product branding. It was very successful. You, you may even find sometimes a red tab that doesn't even have Levi's on it still today. And that was because we reached a point where Levi's had to actually trademark the red tab. And that had to be a red tab without any other identifying characteristics. Therefore, a red tab was simply the trademark R began to be produced. Now, some say even Levi's website says that these are like one in 10, but I'm telling you, if you get out there looking at a lot of Levi's, whether they be old or new, you're going to have a hard time finding one that only has the R and not Levi's on it. Uh, most of the, the uh, people that really do a lot of research into vintage denim and to denim in general and are into uh, Levi's especially, they will say that it's probably more like one out of every 100 actually have uh, a tab with without Levi's written on it. But anyway, I don't want to digress for too long. So the early red tabs, some of the things about these that make them special, of course, red tabs for most of Levi's uh, production time, most of their history, uh, were made primarily in the United States. There are uh, some references to some earlier Levi's, I, I say earlier, definitely in the late 60s, early 70s, I think being made in Canada. But of course we know that that began to change in the 90s as we had NAFTA and we had so many garment factories that were closing their doors and moving out of the country. And the same thing happened with Levi's. The last Levi's factory that was operational in the United States closed in 2002. That's why we often use the 90s as kind of the, the dividing line for a lot of clothing in terms of, of true made in USA vintage or not. Even though there was some clothing made after you know the year 2000, some clothing made in the United States after the year 2000, it was very limited and very small amounts. Um, another thing that you'll find about these these early examples of the red tab uh, denim is that they use something called selvage denim, and this was produced primarily at the Cone Mills factory. At least that was their primary supplier of this particular denim. It was a very strong, uh, very sturdy denim. Um, and it's, it's again known because of that selvage line. You can turn a pair of Levi's inside out and look at the leg seam and if it has that selvage line and if you're not sure what that is, just Google it. Type it in and you can see some pictures really quickly of what this looks like. 
Uh, you won't see this on the new versions, but on the vintage Levi's, if they're old enough, especially Levi's from the 1970s, I, I'm not doing a video on all Levi's products, so we're not gonna talk about cutoff dates on all that stuff today, but you can look that stuff up. There's information out there on it. But those are some things that made them very special. And actually in 2017, the last of the Cone Mills factory shut down that was operational in North Carolina. So those are also gone. Now, that gets us to our topic, which is actually the Levi's jackets. Now, as you study those and look into it, there were basically three types, type one, type two, and type three. Very simple way to keep them separated. Uh, but, but there's certain characteristics that help us to distinguish between these. And to be honest, the likelihood of you running upon a type one or type two when you're out just thrifting or yard selling, uh, it's pretty slim. Uh, those are going to be highly valuable. I mean, hundreds, when we say hundreds, like eight, nine hundred dollars and up, if not several thousand dollars if you find one of those. Uh, but we'll very briefly, I'll very briefly tell you a little bit about uh, each of those particular uh, jackets. So to begin with, okay, we have the Type 1. So the Type 1 jacket was produced between around 1905-ish. There's some that say that Levi's was actually making a denim shirt before that that could be kind of classified as their first jacket, but around 1905 until about 1953. So this one lasted for several decades. It was a very popular iteration, sometimes called the 506 or the 506 double X. Um, again, this is the top one jacket. So this, uh, this jacket had a single uh, left-hand side uh, pocket. It would, did not have a flap. It wasn't closed, at least not the initial iteration of it. And it was actually referred to, like in catalogs, as a blouse and not a jacket to begin with. And this was up until 1938. It also had no tabs, so not only without a pocket flap, but without a tab on it. Uh, the tabs were, of course, not introduced until 1936. So mostly up until about 1938, it's called a blouse, and up until 1936, there's no red tab. It also included on the back of it a cinch buckle that pulls, you know, like those cinch belts, in place of what we think of probably today on the traditional trucker style, the Type 3, the tabs with the buttons. We'll leave that alone for now and come back to it in a minute. So that being said, 1936, we have the red tab with the BE. That's when that appears, not only on the 501s, but also on the jackets. They begin to place these red tabs and it goes on the pocket. And so this appears, uh, the second edition of this jacket shortly after this is introduced. And so one of the rarest jackets that you will find will be a type one jacket that is a first edition, meaning that has the single pocket and has a red tab with Levi's on it. Now, the second edition is introduced pretty quickly and it has two of those jean pockets and in a place it has a bronze buckle in the back, which is a little different. Um, so that was in place of the cinch buckle that had been on the earlier edition. So this is still the top one jacket, just a different edition of it. Each of these jackets go through different stylings and I'm not gonna tell about every single style change that takes place, but I thought this one was important because this was the introduction of the red tab, which is of course a part of the uh, distinguishing uh, trademarks of the jacket behind me. So that being said, we move on to uh, the, well, I, I'll tell you this right quick because I thought this was interesting. In 1941, if you know much about World War II, then during World War II, there was a big push by the government to save on everything. Uh, uh, we, you may have heard of the zoot suit riots where they had these suits that used, they were real baggy, used a lot of extra fabric, and there was these riots broke out because they had to introduce a suit called the victory suit that was, you know, narrow lapel, short waistcoat, all this stuff, no vest to save on fabric. And Levi's did something, you know, kind of similar. They removed the tabs from the pockets. The flaps were gone, not the tabs, but the flaps. Um, and so beginning in 1941, there were no flaps and the buttons began to be the donut hole buttons that you think about sometimes you see on Levi's. Now, this lasts until 1947. After the war, they go back to the flaps. But then the Type 2 jacket, which is sometimes called the 507 double X is introduced in 1953. Now this jacket doesn't last quite a decade. It's from 1953 until about 1962. Okay, so about 1962, possibly just 1961. There's some conflicting evidence on that. Um, but anyway, this Type 2 jacket, it also features the big E on the red tab on the pocket. Um, it is uh, uh, it's fitted, it has button flaps. Um, it has no pocket rivets. So pocket rivets have been used on the Type 1 jackets. Pocket rivets are removed. Um, it uses bar tacks instead, a very heavy stitching that's very strong. 
uh, and reliable. And the side adjusters are going to replace the cinch. This is when the side adjusters are first introduced. It also uses a salvage denim that you can see on the inside placket. That's where you open up, like where the buttons go down. If you peel that back where that seam folds around, you'll see the salvage line down the inside of that seam. Now, that gets us through the Type 2. Now the Type 2, we could talk about more about it, different you know details, but I'm really interested in Type 3 because this is the one that everyone is familiar with. It is uh, the one that's still being made today, although it's gone through different editions, uh, different variations. The same basic jacket overall is what's being produced. And this began to be produced, we think, in 1962, but in reality we have, even Levi's doesn't always know this because Levi's had Years back, had introduced information saying, you know, that this was the earliest one produced. And then there were uh, catalog clippings that showed up that were authentic catalog clippings that showed this Type 3 jacket being offered for sale by Levi's in 1961. So it's, it's amazing to me when we try to clarify all this, it's hard because even Levi's sometimes doesn't have their own story straight. That being said, uh, we know that by 1962, the Type 3 jacket had fully taken its place as the uh, uh, jacket available by Levi's, the denim jacket available. Now, some things about this. As I said, it's referred to as the trucker jacket. Up until 1984, it doesn't have side pockets. So uh, the side pockets would be, well, literally on the side, you know, right here. They're the ones where you slide your hands in. And so up until 1984, there were no side pockets. This happens when, the, when Levi's is given the uh, privilege of helping to outfit the U.S. Olympic team in 1984 for the Olympic Games being held in Los Angeles. And um, at that time, of course, they wanted to put, you know, hand warming pockets on the jackets for the athletes. And so after that, they became a pretty normal addition. They became the standard for Levi's jackets being produced. Again, different iterations of the same type, just different editions or stylings of it over the years. Now, no side pockets till 84. In 1971, Levi's technically quits producing new Big E tabs. Now, this is important to keep in mind because we didn't say that they don't use a Big E tab on the jackets after 1971 or on any garments. But what they do is they quit producing the Big E tabs. And in fact, you have Little E tabs even introduced possibly before 1971, but definitely beginning in 1971, they are the only ones that are being produced and distributed to the factories. Think about that. We know how this stuff works. If you really think about it, it's almost common sense. If we have any left today, right? So care tags were officially introduced in 1971, and this was uh, done by the U.S. government under the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, and it was officially, officially referred to as the care labeling rule. And so all uh, garments manufactured in the, in the United States from that point on had to have uh, care labels included with them. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey for some because a lot of people say, okay, if, if they quit producing big E's in 19, beginning in 1971, that coincides also with the requirement of a care tag, then any garment made by Levi's with a care tag should not have a big E symbol on it or a big E uh, red tab. I don't know if it's that cut and dry. And, and I mentioned this already uh, as we talked about how those supplies a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll get more into that. So my jacket here specifically, if you was to look at the, the label on mine where the, the uh, tag is, and I'll show you an up close of it real quick. I don't know how well the GoPro will allow you to see this, but so my jacket specifically is a 70505-0217, which would have been the one of the first uh, iterations of the, the trucker jacket after what's known as the 557, I believe is what they called it. If you find uh, on the back side of the buttons, uh, that's, you know, if, if this is the front, right? You flip it around, and that side, that silver, that silver side, and I know you can't see it in the in the frame too good. I'll try to give you a better shot of this. But that silver side of it, okay, on the back side, that will have a number on it, okay? And so in most cases, those numbers, when it is a vintage item, will be single or double digits. When I say vintage, I don't mean like, 
you know, made in USA vintage. I'm talking about like pre-1971. Okay, in most cases, it'll be a single or a double digit. And a lot of times, uh, if it has anything on it at all. Now, that being said, I don't know that that was 100% the case. Now, we can pretty much say that if you have a Type 1 or Type 2 jacket and it has a button code on it or a care tag, if it has a button code that is more than two digits or if it has a care tag, then it is absolutely not an authentic vintage jacket. Now, it could be authentically made by LVC, Levi's Vintage Clothing Division, but it is not going to be uh, one that is old. Now, a couple other things. Uh, we, we do know, like I said, that there are some few, we believe, of the trucker style uh, made in the late 60s, we're talking about like 69 or 70 through 71, that might have like a three digit code on the back of those buttons because we have examples that seem to say that to us that have been authenticated. Pre-71, another thing that, that sets these apart is next to the bottom buttonhole. Next to the bottom buttonhole on the jacket. And I'll try to show you this as well. Okay, so maybe you can see that. So next to the bottom buttonhole, there is a single set of stitches on the ones made after this, most of the ones made after this. Now, I think this is again one of those blurry areas. And what we find is that even though they make a general change, a general change in how uh, production is, is, is conducted on these jackets, sometimes it takes a little while, I think, for all this to catch up and become uniform throughout the process. And especially probably in these, these eras uh, where you know management was a lot different. It wasn't you know, computerized like it is today. Uh, so making changes sometimes took a little more time. Um, and maybe there were people that just, you know, I've been making it the same way for 20 years. Why would I change now? But for the most part, you won't see single stitching past about 1971. So it's usually a good identifying trademark for jackets that, you know, 1971 and before the single line of stitching. Most of the ones made after that have a double row of stitching on that side of the uh, buttonhole at the bottom. All right. So what else do we need to go over? So this gets to the interesting part so so ultimately for this video my goal is to kind of present you with the information that that i've got regarding uh how to identify a vintage levi's denim jacket and so i can't tell you of certainty that i know you know uh, uh anywhere i've even scratched the surface say but i've done a lot of research spent a lot of hours reading on message boards official sites blogs uh, the levi's websites and and articles and this is the best that I can do with the information that's out there. And this is a very condensed form. You're going to have to do some of your own research. Uh, this might get you interested because some of this stuff is really valuable. Um, but the thing that I think stands out for mine, and this is, this is where I'm landing on it right now. I, I feel like this jacket is authentic. Okay. Now you would say, okay, well, it's got the big E. Okay. That's one thing we know. It's got the big E tab. I know this one looks really kind of crispy too. It makes it look makes you think oh there's no way that one could be vintage you know it's just too new i don't know if you can even see that because it's very hard to get anything in the view of the gopro and be able to make it out but again you have the big e tab red tab you have uh another thing i didn't mention these these tags the the brown tags leather tags or paper, you know, like tags. But that smaller reduced size tag was only used for a certain amount of time. That's what I'm getting at. Now, I think it began in 1968, maybe 68 to like 83 that one was used. I can't remember now. I didn't write that part down. Uh, but that's a different tag because before that they were larger and more square. And then after that, you know, there was this period where they had these smaller tags like what I've got. Um, I don't know if those hand signals are working or not on the GoPro, but hey, I tried it. Um, that being said, the, the thing that I, I wanted to really point to is that the argument is always that it can't be a big E, can't be authentic if it has a care tag. And so one of the reasons I started off with some of the history of Levi's and specifically 501s is to tell you this. We know for a fact there have been uh, Levi's 501 jeans that after care tags were introduced that, that you can date using the care tag that were manufactured as late as 1973 that also have a big E tab on them. 
Now, some would say, well, that's not possible. They didn't, they didn't make Big E. Well, they may not have made new red tabs, like produced the tab itself with the Big E after 1971. But you don't take in consideration maybe the large backstock that was available to a lot of the plants. And so there wasn't just one manufacturing facility. There were many. And so some of these, no doubt, had a larger backstock than others. And as is normally the case, they didn't throw this stuff away. They continued to use the backstock until it was used up. And in fact, we're pretty certain that up until the early mid 70s, there were still some, some uh, factories that were using the last of these big E tabs on some garments, including, including the jackets. And so I feel like mine is authentic based on everything that I have looked at. Um, there's also information about the buttons. They're flatter. Mine match that. Um, the flatter buttons. I've got the the almost black or navy blue uh, tacking bar tacking under the pocket. Um, of course, the care label is cloth. Now that's another thing. You will not find a Big E jacket with a paper care tag. The paper care tags somewhere in the mid 70s. I think it was 73 or 74. I don't think there's ever been one of those authenticated that had a paper care tag. Jackets use the, the woven or cloth tag up until that point. And so it's very common uh, to see 71 and, and later jackets uh, for, for trucker style Levi's that are vintage and also have a care tag. And again, I said that about the three numbers on the button and that being something that is sometimes acceptable because mine does. And although there are LVC, Levi's Vintage Clothing items that have been produced very similar to this, that have a three digit code on the button, as far as I can tell from research, the three digit code on my jacket does not match any of the three digit codes that have been used on those modern repros. And so best I can tell from everything that I've researched, my jacket is authentic and that's how I intend to list it on eBay. Um, I do invite you to give me any of your feedback, uh, uh, criticisms, I guess, if you got them, you know, if you want to challenge something I said, I'm not pretending to be an expert. I'm doing my very best to communicate the information that I've gathered after days and days and days of research and hours spent reading across multiple message boards and other sites. So I hope this helps some of you. I found it very intriguing. Um, it was a great find. You know, my wife is responsible for this. She's the one that came up to me in the store as we were getting ready to leave. I mean, we were in our last probably 10 minutes in the store. I had gone looking for it. It's like, hey, what do you think about this? You know, and so it was just amazing. You know, a big E uh, Levi's product. First time I'd ever found one out in the wild. And so uh, usually you have to go to a place that specializes in vintage clothing or maybe like a flea mall or something like that where someone else has already discovered it. Sometimes in a state sale, you might dig one of these up, but they're, they're getting harder and harder to find. So I was very pleased. I'm excited to get it listed, see what it goes for. I, you know, I feel like it's going to probably bring me $300 or so when I sell it. And, uh, and hopefully it won't take too long to get it sold and uh, have a happy customer uh, on the other end. All right, guys. So that brings us to the end of the video. Um, I hope, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, God bless you. God loves you. I love you. But don't forget, he loves you even more. Uh, more than I could ever do. So, uh, you know, uh, stay safe, take care, enjoy this holiday. Uh, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. I don't know if I'll get this out before Thanksgiving Day, but hopefully. Uh, but either way, if it's before or after, happy Thanksgiving or hope your Thanksgiving was great. Uh, you guys take care. Uh, stay at it. Keep working hard and don't give up. See you on the next one.